Hey everyone, how's it going? Today we're going to be talking about some forgotten aircraft. When you think about any given conflict, any given aircraft role, and any given military theater, there are probably a few standout planes that come to your mind. Whether it be due to their prevalence on the battlefield, their overall performance, or the performance of a single individual. For World War I, with air combat in its relative infancy, the first plane that probably comes to mind is this, because of the Red Baron. For the Pacific War in World War II, you may think of the Japanese Zero, or maybe the P-51 Mustang. Over in Europe, you may think of the Spitfire, or the BF-109, or maybe the Stuka. I could go on and on, but the point is that there are relatively few designs that are most remembered, while most others are kind of left forgotten by most of the general public. Similarly, in most conflicts, certain battles and theaters are far more prominent than others, and some lack prominence to the degree that they're basically forgotten conflicts. There are several examples of this in World War II, from the Burma campaign on the more prominent end of the Forgotten Spectrum to something like the Battle of Madagascar on the other end. Yes, Britain attacked and captured Vichy France-controlled Madagascar in 1942, in a battle that took six months. It's weird that the Madagascar movies didn't teach me about that. Maybe they should have had King Julian live in a downed British aircraft. So, with all of that being said, the subject for today is one of those forgotten planes that by and large served in one of those forgotten theaters. A forgotten American plane design with a production run that numbered nearly 2,000, that never actually served with America, and instead was far more prominent in South and Southeast Asia, serving in the British Royal Air Force. This is the Vultee A-31 Vengeance. The beginning of the A-31 project is somewhat contested, but one of those scenarios is more likely than the other one. The first and more commonly cited scenario is that in mid-1940, around July, Britain, under the predecessor to Lend-Lease, called Cash and Carry, sent over aircraft specifications to vault for a new dive-bomber design, to be produced for and exclusively purchased by Britain. This is the short story that's cited by numerous aircraft encyclopedias and similar style books. However, according to the book Vengeance, the vault Vengeance Dive Bomber by Peter C. Smith, another country was the origin point. The lend-lease slash cash-and-carry aspect of that story remains the same. The plane was to be designed and sold to a country that was allied to the United States as well. But it wasn't Britain, it was actually France. In early 1940, the war situation in Western Europe could be described as being similar to the beginning of a boxing match, with both sides just sort of staring at each other, sizing each other up and waiting to see if they make the first move. While Germany had invaded Poland the year prior, which led to Britain and France declaring war on Germany in turn, the following eight months contained very little fighting, the so-called phony war. While there were some French offensives very early on, these amounted to very little in terms of territory gained and casualties caused. Germany was simply not at the military capacity to be able to take out France and Britain just yet, having devoted the vast majority of their troops into Poland, and also Hitler wanted to try and make peace with Britain in the meantime while both France and Britain both also weren't too prepared for the war, nor were they really itching to actually fight in the war, fearing that any attacks they make would be repaid in kind by Germany. This led to a very long period of both sides preparing plans and building up strength, and part of this building of strength involved France revamping its stock of aircraft. This led to a group of French Air Force officers going over to America in the name of the Le Ami de l'Air. How's my French? I took French in high school and remember absolutely nothing. To search for a new modern aircraft to supplement their stocks, drawing upon their knowledge of the effectiveness of the Junkers Ju-87 Stuka in the Spanish Civil War 
they wanted a modern mono-wing dive bomber of their very own. For this, they would come to an agreement with Volte Aircraft for a new dive bomber design, then known as the Model 72 or the V-72. Measuring in at 12.12 meters long, 14.63 meters wide, and 4.67 meters tall, the V-72 most notably had a rather strange wing shape, with the outer sections being almost forward swept, and with the inner sections being angled, this gave the wings almost a W shape, not a severe W shape as the design of the BVP-188, but still a W shape nonetheless. This was done due to the initial straight wing being installed in such a way that the center of gravity was actually off. So instead of moving the entirety of the wing, it was decided to just alter the outer half of the wing, an easier fix that wouldn't require changes to the wing root or the fuselage. Staying with the wing as it was to be a dive bomber, the V-72 had a somewhat uncommon feature of the wing having a zero degree angle of incidence. Angle of incidence being the difference between the longitudinal axis and the angle at which the wings are set or mounted. Typically, wings have a slight upward angle to ensure that the fuselage and cockpit can be parallel to the ground in level flight. In a dive though, having this slight upward angle can be detrimental to dive bombing accuracy and aim. So the V-72 would be given a zero degree angle of incidence to help increase dive bombing accuracy. The trade-off though was that in level flight, the fuselage and cockpit would have to sit slightly nose up, thus reducing the vision of the pilot. But given that it was to be a dive bomber first and foremost, the vision of the pilot in level flight was probably less important than the vision of the pilot in a dive. For its armament in comparison to the Stuka, France's inspiration, and reason for wanting this plane, the V-72 would be a bit stronger in both the gun armament and maximum bomb load. The Stuka design that the French were familiar with, the JU-87A, was outfitted with two forward-firing 7.92mm machine guns, one rear-firing machine gun, and a maximum bomb load of around 1,100 pounds, but an effective bomb load of half that because the engines weren't strong enough. On the V-72, there would be four forward-firing 7.62mm machine guns, two rear-firing machine guns, and an initial max load of 1,100 pounds as well but on the V-72, the engine was strong enough to actually handle 1,100 pounds. Outfitted with a Wright R2600 Cyclone radial engine with around 1,600 horsepower, the top speed would sit around 280 miles an hour, while the early Stuka sat at under 200, nearly 100 miles an hour slower. France would place their order and was set to begin receiving the V-72 in October 1940 with just a handful being delivered per month until 1941, where that would increase to dozens per month. Their total order would amount to around 300 planes, and they would receive exactly zero of these. This was because France was invaded in May 1940 and fell by the end of June, so there wasn't really a France that was left to receive the planes. Sure, there was Vichy France and the Free French Government in exile, but still, with the fall of France, that order would never actually be fulfilled. Instead, Britain, in July 1940, in their own search for a dive bomber design, would come across the in-progress V-72, and then believe they had the perfect dive bomber for their air forces. The order placed by the British would be less than the French order, 200 planes instead of 300, but there was a definitive contract in place that Volte would actually be able to fill, and with the purchase of a new factory in Nashville, Tennessee, from which to build the V-72, in just about eight months, the first frame was completed in March 1941, and by July 1941, the V-72 had taken to the air. It was either in March or in July, that the first flight took place, some conflicting information. 
On one of those days, a christening of the plane took place with the presence of Lord Halifax of Britain and his wife. The initial flight testing of the V-72 showed that it was a relatively decent aircraft, controlling relatively well with a decent top speed, but there was also some room for improvement. For example, one test pilot disliked the dive brakes that were installed. On the V-72 were dive brakes that looked like an air vent grate, and this one test pilot wanted dive brakes that looked closer to Swiss cheese. He was ignored, and the air vent brakes were proceeded with. Also, in the meantime, while work and design continued, the British would increase their total order to around 600 planes, with their spare parts, and added radio equipment installed as well. This would cost tens of millions of dollars in 1940-41 dollars, but Britain was good for it. No amount of money, though, would end up changing what happened in late 1941 that would drastically alter the course of the V-72. On December 7, 1941, when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, the American military swiftly took measures to look into their military stocks, to see what they would need, and to prepare for the war that was ahead of them. Drastically lacking in U.S. stocks were modern dive bombers of just about any kind, while planes like the Dauntless and the Helldiver had flown prior to Pearl Harbor, the U.S. had very few of these to go around, and the Helldiver then basically went into production hell, so other than those few, the stock of dive bombers they had mainly consisted of old biplanes and repurposed heavy aircraft like the A-20. With Volte in the process of producing hundreds of dive bombers right in Tennessee, the immediate solution was clear. The U.S. military seized upwards of 300 frames, basically negating the British contract. First priority would go to the United States, which did lead to a bit of anger from the British military, and the U.S. military would basically just shrug that off. With upwards of 300 V-72s to be allocated to the U.S. military, the question was now this. Did they actually want them? For one, the U.S. would call them the A-31, not the V-72. Not terribly important, but still, going forward, it would be called the A-31. As the A-31 was designed to French and British specifications that differed in what American designers and the U.S. military wanted, there would have to be a lot changed on this design. The U.S. military found the armor lacking, the fuel tanks not leak-proof and also lacking armor, the forward armament was lacking, the engine power was lacking, and the nose-up level flight was just annoying and they didn't like it. Additionally, they also found that American bombs were not the correct size for the bomb bay. I guess British bombs were a bit smaller so either the bombs or the bay would have to be altered as well. So much had the change in the A-31 design that by March 1942, the decision to seize 300 planes for the U.S. military was actually being called into question, and the very production of the A-31 was also being called into question. Considering all of the work that needed to be done in converting the A-31s into viable American aircraft, Proposed solutions included completely modifying them to be viable on one end of the spectrum, to fully allocating them for foreign sale and giving them all to the British in the middle, to outright canceling the A-31 production program entirely on the other end of the spectrum. In the end, basically two of these were done in some capacity. For combat aircraft, the vast majority of the A-31s made would go to other allied countries like Britain. On the other hand, Volte and the U.S. military would make an improved version of the A-31 known as the A-35, with alterations that would make it more appealing to U.S. pilots. The engine would be upgraded to help increase top speed, the desired armor was added, and the angle of incidence of the wing was increased to a more standard level. This, of course, then changed how it handled in dive bombing, but vision in level flight seems to have been deemed more important by the U.S. military. 
and quickly we'll get America's experience with the A31-35 out of the way now, as they kind of didn't do anything with them. The problem for the A35 was that the US now had far more substantial numbers of dauntless dive bombers at their disposal, and in the war they were being used to decent effect. By late 1942, early 1943, the military situation in the Pacific against the Japanese was changing in America's favor, and with the Dauntless currently being effective, there wasn't really a need for a new dive bomber to add to the fold. Even though some apparently believe that the new and improved A-35 was actually better than the Dauntless, there was simply no need for it. Of the hundreds of A-35s made for the U.S. military, a good number of them were either sent over to the British, or if they stayed in the U.S., they were converted for other less important roles, like training and as a target tug, basically to be used for aerial target practice. The first Allied country to receive a production model A-31 was Britain, sort of. Technically, it was Australia, but Britain still had some level of influence and control over their once directly controlled colony, so kind of Britain by proxy. Australia would place an order for some dive bombers in mid-1940, an order for 243 Brewster Bermudas, also known as the Buccaneer in America. However, problems with that design led to Britain stepping in and suggesting that they instead take some small numbers of the A-31 that the British would be receiving. Australia began receiving the A-31 in very small numbers in May 1942, but not really enough yet to warrant them being used in combat. It wouldn't be until April 1943 that substantial numbers of the A-31 arrived in Australia, and as they trickled in in late 1942 and early 1943, Australian Squadron No. 12 would use their small number of A-31s for patrols, training, and search missions, never actually seeing combat early on. In June 1943, the A-31s would finally see some actual combat against the Japanese, in conjunction with other Allied forces, Number 12 Squadron and their 12 A-31s would attack two Japanese-occupied villages on the island of Salaru in Indonesia, as Japan was possibly constructing an airfield. The mission was completely successful, and all 12 A-31s returned alive. Ultimately, from this point until March 1944, the Australian A-31s played a very minor role in the Pacific theater occasionally being tasked with dive-bombing Japanese positions as part of greater Allied offensives, while also seeing minor use as patrol aircraft. Their overall service in Australia was mixed. The A-31s did suffer from some general maintenance issues that led to equipment failures, but when they were used in combat, they were relatively effective. Still, they were also viewed as not being as effective as Allied leadership wanted, which led to them being replaced by B-24 Liberators, for much greater offensive potential. As for the British, they would use the A-31 much more extensively, probably more than Australia and America combined, but they wouldn't be using them in Europe. One major reason was that Britain's experience with dive bombing in North Africa had kind of soured them to the idea, so they probably didn't want them to be used in the more important European theater. Additionally, testing led them to believe that the A-31 was an overall worse aircraft than the Ferry Battle Light Bomber, a design first flown in 1936, with them believing that the A-31 was worse in every regard. This meant that even though they had probably dozens to hundreds of A-31s by late 1942, early 1943, they kind of didn't want them either. So they were largely transferred over to Asia to serve in the Burma campaign alongside Indian forces. In this theater, the A-31s were surprisingly effective, especially given that Britain didn't want them. In early but still rather extensive combat operations against Japan in mid-1943, 
in East India and West Burma, the combat record of the A-31 was actually outstanding. Two squadrons, the 82nd and 110th, would use the A-31 for at least dozens of sorties, hitting their targets far more often than not, and losing a grand total of zero planes in return. Again, even though Britain didn't really want these planes anymore, and went so far as to publicly state that they did not like dive bombers, they would also publicly state in July 1943 that the A-31 had been incredibly effective in Burma, showcasing maximum efficiency and no losses. Still though, they stuck to their guns and would not use the A-31 anywhere but the Pacific, where they would continue to see rather significant success. Even as the rainy season came and severely reduced the effectiveness of dive bombing on account of all the clouds in the sky, the A-31s managed to adapt and carry out their missions still, changing on the fly from dive bombing to low-level bombing, perhaps much like a light bomber would. Continuing into 1944, the A-31s continued to see success against Japanese encampments and supply lines, with pilots reportedly kind of loving this design. However, while the pilots did like the planes and were rather successful against the Japanese, the British military command still didn't like them, and after July 16, 1944, Britain would pull the A-31 from active combat duty as this was pretty much smack dab in the middle of monsoon season, and flying and combat in general was all the more difficult because of it, this was their perfect opportunity to finally pull it. They wouldn't be flying as much anyway, and in mid-1944, Japanese forces were struggling severely and the war situation was much different. With them on their last legs, bigger and more powerful aircraft could come in and help clean up the remaining and retreating Japanese forces. The A-31 was well liked in the theater, but it just simply was not as strong as medium or heavy bombers could be, especially not in more widespread offensives. After being pulled from active combat, the A-31s in British hands would largely fill the same roles that they did over in America as trainers and target tugs. They would also use them for some experiments, fitting sprayers to them to test them as mobile smoke screens or even as chemical weapons dispensers, even though those had been banned in 1925. But still, the Allies were winning, so if the British did end up using them, I do doubt they would have received any form of punishment anyway. In total, just under 2,000 A-31s were made up into 1944 before production would cease. Most went to either Britain or the United States, with a good number also going to Australia, and a few going to Free French and Brazilian forces. Their stories in those two cases are far less extensive, as they were basically just used as trainers in both cases with Brazil using them until 1948 for training, and during the war they used them for some patrols as well. The Free French, for their part, found them lacking when they received them and only used them for training. It was mainly with the British that they saw a rather surprising amount of success, albeit in an oft-ignored theater of the war. In all fairness, it isn't terribly surprising that the A-31 is pretty much a forgotten plane, not being used either in Europe or in the Pacific directly with American forces, and otherwise it was used as a trainer. I mean, how talked about is something like the T-6 Texan with their 15,000 strong production run? Trainers just aren't the most interesting planes. Regardless though, the A-31 has a rather interesting story and journey, changing hands, changing plans, being unloved, and still performing well regardless. Alright, and with that, we're going to go ahead and end for today. So, thank you all for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. I do love that for such an underappreciated plane, it had the name of Vengeance. It's like the water brand Liquid Death. It's just water, but what a great, more extreme name. The A-31 was just an okay dive bomber, but it had a great name. It'd be like if the Toyota Prius was called the Destroyer. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video.
and I hope you learned something. So, see ya.